Hey everyone, welcome to another episode where I interview makers and hardware entrepreneurs. And today we've got John Vanden Heuenhausen with Hidden Radio. We're going to talk about how he's built his company and the cool things that he's doing. So John, thanks for joining us. No problem. Hey Steve. Thanks. So tell us, uh, what is Hidden Radio? What are you guys doing? Um, hit, well, Hidden firstly is our company and our goal with our company is to create very simple intuitive products where uh, the brand becomes uh, the product becomes the brand less so than a brand becoming the product. So the first product is uh, the Hidden Radio, which we launched on Kickstarter a few months ago, and uh, basically it's a simple and intuitive uh, Bluetooth uh, speaker and radio, and literally uh, as simple as it gets. The, li- the further you lift up the cap, the louder the volume gets, and it's about as complex as we get. You know? Very simple product. That's really cool. So how did this idea come to you? Um, we, about uh, five years ago, uh, I was working it for a Motorola out of Chicago and I was just brainstorming one weekend uh, on a simple intuitive product and um, this kind of came to mind. Uh, so I sent it over to Vitor in Milan uh, he loved the idea so we started kind of toying with it and developing it and uh, we put it on the web and uh, you know just create a simple website and the response was overwhelming. So. We tried for a few years to do something with it, and um, eventually, um, you know, we got the right manufacturer, the right development team, and that kind of all culminated into the uh, Kickstarter uh, project, and that got us the money to put it in production. That's really cool. So you actually you came up with the idea. You didn't know how you're going to do it yet, but you built a website and you put it out there, and you got you got feedback to see what people wanted. Yeah, just um, you know, we've seen like a lot of people uh, kind of do a similar structure, but you know, it wasn't so much with the same goal in mind. But we just wanted to understand if there was a res- an audience receptive to our product, and um, you know, to be honest, the PR that we got out of it was a bit insane. You know, a lot of companies try to get the same level of PR and spend a lot of money doing it and don't get anything. So we kind of realized we had something pretty special and it'd be uh, crazy to waste it. And, and you know, people just love the product. You know, there was no hype or, uh, you know, uh, you know, it was a very humble product. They just really wanted it. So uh, we decided to take it forward. And, and this was before you even had a working prototype. It was just like you had this really, you had this detailed concept and here's what it would do. And people just latched onto that idea. Exactly. And the, uh, the concept changed over time. And as things do with prototypes, we created many prototypes, work with the development team. And it naturally, the function, I think, got better in a lot of ways uh, from the original concept. And uh, yeah, it kind of went from there. So, so what's your background? Because you were working for Motorola before. Yeah, and that's where I met my business partner, Vitor. And uh, we used to work together in Motorola in Milan. Uh, Vitor is still based out of Milan. And then... Um, you know, about five years ago, I moved out to the West Coast where I was a design lead at HP. And uh, eventually from there, I left and, uh, you know, started this business as well as, you know, doing other products. And uh, that kind of brings us up to the current day. So how many, how, how long did it take you to go from concept to working manufacturable prototype? You know, um, that's kind of a difficult um Thing to answer because we had a we had a working prototype within a few months, um, but we went through many prototypes in order to get it right. And to get it right took a couple of years of uh, you know because we were working on this on the side, you know, aside from our full time jobs as well, and we were kind of working at it, you know, getting the mechanism and you know exactly right. And a lot of the innovation with this is within the mechanism, um, you know, getting that to work perfect, making it smooth. And then being able to fit the speaker and the battery and all the other stuff together. It's actually very complex inside. It seems like a simple product from the outside, but inside is kind of, uh, it's almost like a Tetris pattern. You know, trying to fit everything in and still have a small size and have a good bass volume. So it was uh, very challenging, but, you know, really a ton of fun, you know, trying to make it work, you know. So, so what, what tools did you build to, to use to prototype this? You know, did you outsource this to a shop or you know, did you do something like tech shop or did you have these uh, tools in your garage? No, we, um, we did a lot of the CAD ourselves. Uh, excuse the sirens going past. I, I, live, that's better. I live on a busy street in San Francisco. And usually around 6 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, I think the after hours drinks brings out uh, the ambulances. <laughs> no but anyway, uh, we... Um, we uh, did a lot of the CAD ourselves. We worked with um, a lot of engineers uh, throughout that we met through these companies that we've worked for. Um, yeah, a lot of guys in the Bay Area have worked for Apple and Motorola, you know, great engineers. 
And uh, so we worked and developed a database, you know, what you call a 3D database of all the moving parts. And then we, from there, we basically create SLAs, which are 3D printed parts. And that's the first proof of concept to understand if it works because the tolerances and the size of this stuff, it's, you can't just go into your workshop and build them. You know, it's right. very difficult to build them. So once we got that working and we worked out a lot of the details, we then sent it to our model shop. Uh, which is kind of, uh, you know, the, these high-end model shops, which, um, you know, again, a lot of the big companies use. And, uh, you know, to give an idea, one prototype with those guys costs around $5,000. But it's a perfectly working prototype, and it looks beautiful, and it's just gorgeous looking thing. But, it, uh, but you work out all the problems, and talking with them, they're like, yeah, we had to add a bit of grease here. We actually had to change the tolerance on this part and we learn so much through that whole process and then once we have it kind of worked out we then go and talk to our development team in our manufacturer and they kind of take what we've done and then they reorganize it for manufacturing so that it can be done on a mass uh, scale and made you know so they can make you know one to two thousand a day and so on very cool so when you're reaching out to these uh, these um, these engineers to help you design it you know it's sort of like a side project you know it's like they have their day jobs and then on the side they're helping you design this um, this product absolutely you know like if we were to go and do this um, you know like a big company you know and go and talk to a uh, engineering consultant so it would run into the millions of dollars of development it just you, we would never be able to afford it and uh, you know this whole new kind of um, uh, you know, revolution in uh, you know creating products you know without the big companies that's happening I think this is all a part of it you know Finding the right people who are willing to do it, maybe for a lower price, and it's not their their primary goal is not financial. They want to do it because they love the product, and pretty much everyone that worked on it did it because they really liked it. And you know, some people were paid, uh, some people just did it for the joy of it. They we we tried to pay them, and they said you know they just really enjoy it. So that, that's always nice when it's uh, you know some people just want to do it for fun, and that's when you get the best stuff. You know. Yeah, I mean that's really cool. So, how did you find the, these engineers to help you? Is this you know through networks? Did you just cold call? I mean, like, what was it? Uh, how did you find uh, it? Cold call. All the people I knew. Okay. And um, you know, there's always a time when you're trying to be an entrepreneur and starting up. There's kind of I would call it the grace period when people are willing to do work uh, at a very reduced rate or um, or for free. And then once you start to make money then, you know, you, you, you start paying people. So, like, for us, there was a little bit of a grace period. And then it got to a point where it got serious. And then it's like, okay, now we're investing serious cash. And that's why, like, in our campaign, we said there was $50,000 plus of development. You know, that was prototypes, uh, trips, as well as eventually having to pay engineers to do the work. So, um, you know, and there's always a point when working with, say, an Apple engineer, um, you know, he, he just, he's like, look, I'm too busy. So, we're like, okay, that's fine. So, we go and hire people. And have them kind of finish it off. So was there was there any issue like IP issues when somebody's working on a project for you, but then they also say work for Apple or H HP in their day job? Is there any any issue with with that major company because they're do also doing work on the side? Is that is that something? Absolutely, um, you know. And all these guys that we worked with, like the Apple engineer that we worked with, uh, he when he when he started working on this, he left Apple, and okay. you know. That for sure, the, he, you know, any Apple engineer cannot work on anything. It doesn't matter what it is on the side. They want them completely uh, aligned. And, and even, you know, there were some other areas that were great, which we just said, look, you know, we would take your advice, but we don't want you to do any paid work or okay. that's a conflict. And, you know, um, it seems like a lot of the Google were much more flexible there. I think they often even encourage people to do other stuff to keep them. So it just depends on the company and we kind of navigate from there. And, you know, to be honest, a lot of the engineering we could do ourselves. And then when we needed them, they kind of advised us. And, you know, it's a very fluid process. But you guys are pretty cognizant of that, of who could work on stuff, who couldn't. And, and yeah. you, you navigated that. But that, that was something you were aware of. Exactly. And that, that got us to a point that once we, you know, got really serious, then we worked with our development team that, you know, who was really doing the really heavy lifting and that's when we had to start paying people and start doing it with much more of a, a structure. So the actual IP that's in the product now, mm -hmm. um, actually the mechanism that we came up with was actually Vitor's invention, the actual mechanism, and then we worked with our manufacturing team to finalize it and get it ready for production. It seems like you've been, you know, fairly open with what you guys are trying to do and your design, which I'm sure, I'm sure is, has helped you get a lot of um, a lot of PR and buzz, like you were saying. Was there any point where you were 
worried about sharing this with the wrong person or was it just, you know, like the idea seems simple, but actually pulling it off is really, really complicated. So it's not like someone can just take it and run with it. Yeah, you know, like um, even some engineers we spoke to and we told them what we're trying to do, they you know, they were like, oh, we, we don't think it can be done. And, you know, fortunately we proved them wrong. Um, but, you know, so that was a part like, you know, there's a lot of engineering that's gone into a lot of complexity that, um, you know, we've even seen some copycat products, but they're just not even close um, to what's needed. Um, then the other thing is the actual, the stuff that we've shown on Kickstarter and we've shared along the way, um, it, it, that's not our IP. Our IP is an internal mechanism which we haven't, uh, you know, been fully public with yet because we're still in the patent process. Um, so we've made sure to keep that um, under wraps. So all the IP is under wraps. But uh, there's also like we're very, um, we really want to be open, and this is something that's kind of very much a part of the way Vitor and I work. Is like, you know, a lot of people they try to keep everything so secret, and they're so scared of things being stolen. And I know I'm a little bit the opposite. I'm like, well. You know, maybe it'll get, get stolen, but, you know, the, the question is, are you going to go and fight them if they do steal it? And uh, a lot of people don't have the means to do that. So, you know, if it just stays on your computer as your own secret and never sees the light of day, is, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, and I take one example. There was, um, you know, when I was at Motorola, there was a certain uh, user interface pattern that I filed with Motorola, and uh, they didn't patent the user interface design that I had. And, um, there's a very critical function to the iPhone. And then, uh, you know, Motorola said, well, it's never going to be used in any phone, and so we're not going to patent it. And then, you know, six months later, iPhone came out, and uh, you know, I could have been annoyed and been like, oh, that was my idea. But I don't really think it was my idea. I think it was just many minds come up with, you know, similar ideas at the same right. time. Actually, I'm more appreciative that someone did something cool than it just stayed in my head, <laughs> you know, and it never goes anywhere. So I think people need to be a little bit more open. But at the same time, not be naive. Still protect yourself and make sure you do the right things to, you know, ensure that you know a big company doesn't come and crush you. I mean, like protect the things that you can get IP for, but everything else you can be open with, and that's okay. I think so. And that we've really tried to also through the Kickstarter process. I think people have really, um, you know, some backers are like, well, we need more info, and some have been really, uh, oh, you know, this is really what we want, and we've really tried to be as open as possible and. People have really responded to that. Like we've even shown like uh, you know, things we didn't think people would find interesting, like the way the tool opens on a part. You know, adding draft angles to a part. You know, for us, we thought, well, maybe people don't care about that. But people have really responded and really enjoyed the transparency and you know, uh, understanding the whole process. And I think you know, especially something like Kickstarter. You know, like people aren't just buying a product; they're buying into a project. And I think that's the key thing. And like, if they wanted a Bluetooth speaker, they would have gone down the road and bought one. But they want to enjoy the process and see it all come to light, and then see a company get built up from that. Yeah. And so, really, want to bring people along the way and let them, you know, live through what we're living through, and you know, make sure they're a part of the whole thing. And then that's really the fun of it. So yeah, so so being open has has really helped you be successful on Kickstarter. Uh, absolutely, and and also like you know we enjoy it like. Um, you know, we've done a bit of education, you know, uh, Vitor teaches very, uh, you know, very often in Europe and as well as I teach a little bit out here and uh, we, we just enjoy that aspect of it, you know, passing on the info and helping the next generation, you know, people have really helped us and you know, we wouldn't be at the position we're at if people didn't take the time to help us. So we're just, you know, happy to, you know, lend a little bit of a hand if we can. That's, yeah, so it seems like this is really your passion and the, the company is what's allowing you to pursue this. Absolutely. And, you know, it's like, um, you know, in time it'll, you know, turn profit and whatever, but really it's, um, it's been an absolute passion and, you know, we're doing what we love and, uh, yeah, it's kind of the dream, I guess, for that every, every designer wants to do, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. So would this, would this project have been possible five or ten years ago with the technology available or is it, you know, the, the, the technology that's available now has allowed you to finally pursue this? You know, um, obviously things improve over time and speakers and amps and stuff. So definitely, you know, it's improved over the last 10 years. But, you know, the primary thing has been crowdfunding that kind of changed everything. You know, like uh, we had, you know, before even Kickstarter, the crowdfunding revolution, you know, the product was ready and many companies had seen it uh, and they could have reached out and said, we want to develop this with you uh, as a licensing deal with the company. And the, the opportunity was out there. And but they didn't do it, and now that they've seen that it's a market success, 
uh, through Kickstarter and very high market success. Now they're all reaching out to us, and uh, you know, many many companies are reaching out saying, "Well, we want to cooperate, we want to partner, etc." So it's it's completely turned everything on its head. It's really interesting to see. So I mean, you actually had a working manufacturable prototype when you when you launched your Kickstarter campaign, and, and yeah. So so what has Kickstarter allowed you to do? I mean, you've been really successful with it. So what what has that allowed you to do? Well, the the original design we launched, and this is one of the wonderful things that came out of Kickstarter. You know, the original design we launched on Kickstarter had a uh, removable batteries and a slightly small, and it had to have a slightly small speaker because of the removable batteries. And we listened to everyone, and everyone, you know, a lot of the things that people were asking for. And in the end, um, we decided to put an in, uh, inbuilt rechargeable battery. We just, you know, everyone was kind of uh, there was a small proportion that wanted. Uh, removable batteries, but people were like, no, it needs to be, you know, you can just plug it in and recharge, you didn't have to remove the batteries. So we actually went back and uh, re-engineered a part of it. And uh, we we actually put in a, a uh, inbuilt battery so they could be uh, recharged. And okay. what this allowed us to do, because, you know, at the time we had a speaker here and then batteries alongside it, by putting in a rechargeable battery inside, we are able to put a much larger speaker and put the battery on top and what that allowed us to do was put much more bass volume and just a, a bigger speaker gives you better sound so um, yeah. you know it actually it meant that we we're delivering a bit later than we admitted and we told people that before we closed the funding but by and large you know everyone's been supportive and, and I, the, the, the consensus has been you know deliver a great product you know Absolutely. a little bit late than a, a, a pretty good product on time and so um, that's really, you know, we could, we would have had a great product, but you know, this whole kind of market research, if you like, has just made the product even better. And we just got the new prototype, and we put it alongside uh, the market leader. I'm not going to name any names, uh, <laughs> but uh, and it's um it's a louder device. So um you know, once it hits the market for a similar price, you'll get a you know I think a louder uh, you know as good a quality device as the market leader. So you know, and that that really came through the power of the crowdfunding uh, method, you know, it just made a better product. So, um, yeah, we, we, we don't have anything bad to say about the method of, you know, engaging the, the crowd and engaging the group to help us develop a you know, good product. So, yeah, so Kickstarter, you know, they told you what you wanted, what they wanted, and then, and then they helped you fund that change. Yeah, they helped us fund it. Yeah, really wonderful. Um, you know, it's like, it couldn't be better. And, uh, you know, it's you know we, we're always like, well, we you know we had to move the date out a little bit, and so it's that's the most stressful for us because we want to make sure that we keep everybody engaged and happy and good, you know, uh, customers that want to keep coming back. But um, people have been like so encouraging and just like you're doing the right thing, and that's you know it's such a good feeling to know you're you know to be so engaged with your customers and to know what they're feeling. You know, a lot of companies spend so much money trying to understand what their customers are thinking and they tell us right away you know we just go to our comments page it's, it's all there and people are as rude and polite as they want to be and it's uh, it's perfect it's really powerful that's great so what was your last question so what was your biggest obstacle to overcome um, you know the biggest obstacle was probably pre Kickstarter finding the right development partner to um, to manufacture the product, and we traveled, you know, all around the world looking at people. We we looked in uh, U.S., uh, Italy, uh, even Brazil. Um, I went on a trip all through Taiwan and uh, Hong Kong, and we, we looked everywhere. And uh, you know, to be honest, we ended up with a Hong Kong manufacturer. And the reason why we went with them is because they do all the speakers for you know. You can, when we walk down Best Buy, you look at the top brands, and they do them. Uh, so we're a very good company, and uh, a good friend of ours has a personal relationship with the company, so they're highly trustworthy. And uh, you know, we wanted to do it um, closer to home. You know, we, we looked in uh, U.S. and Italy, and you know, the fact of the matter is, and I, you know, it's always tricky. You know, we always try to use local, but a lot of the stuff has moved. All the expertise has moved over to Asia, and um, it just kind of worked out that way. Um, but you know, we're, we're always open to move things. Back home, but our partner over there is so skilled. They work so they work so hard that you know it's they're just wonderful partners to work with. And uh, yeah, it's a global economy now, and um, you know, it's kind of the reason why a lot of people use you know Asian manufacturers because all the expertise is there. 
Yeah, it's like the expertise and then to scale, right? I mean, if you know, if you wanted to sell 10 of these speakers, you could probably make them in the U.S., but if yeah. you want to make 100,000, that's different. Exactly, and it's just, um, you know, it's, uh, and, and the economy's changing, like, you know, I think in the 90s and early 2000s, like, you couldn't even get anything made in the U.S., and I think now, slowly, some things are coming back to the U.S., but still, like, a lot of this stuff, like, to do them all in one place is still, you know, in Asia, and um, so, yeah, it's just, you know, it's a global economy now. Um, but, you know, we've been very happy with these guys. They're just, they're, their work level has been incredible. Their skill is incredible. So, um, yeah, it's been really good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. No worries. I'm more than happy to.